Hello and welcome to Ticket Manager's All Access Interview Series, engaging leaders from across the sports marketing spectrum to identify and explore critical issues in the business of sports, entertainment, sponsorship, activation, ticketing, hospitality, and even more. I'm your host, Jim Andrews, and joining me on this episode to discuss a few of those critical issues facing all of us in sports business and sports marketing, as well as to share some insights from his new book, is Scott O'Neill. Of course, HBSE is home to the Philadelphia 76ers, the New Jersey Devils, uh, leading esports organization Dignitas. And Scott's new book is Be Where Your Feet Are, Seven Principles to Keep You Present, Grounded, and Thriving. Welcome, Scott. It's great to see you again. You know, it beats the stick in the eye, Jim. Life is pretty good. I <laughs> uh, love the summer months. Uh, getting a chance to talk to you is, is going to be, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. Awesome. Well, delighted to, to have you with us. So, yeah, I, I read the book and, and got a lot out of it. And so it's a really great read. And the seventh principle, the, the last one in the book, is trust the process. And I think, you know, lots of us, uh, in our business are, are familiar with with you and, and the process and, and, and what you've done with the 76ers and the rest of HBSE. But as I was reading through it again and kind of reminding myself, you know, what, what it's all about, something struck me that I hadn't thought of before. And I'd like to see what you think about this premise. You know, it, it's a great piece of, of business advice, right, to, to kind of take the, the long-term view. That makes a lot of sense. But because sports fans are so different than customers of any other business, literally fanatics, right? That's where the word comes from. Can sports organizations really live by the idea of, of being patient before seeing results? Or is there just so much pressure you know, to, to win now in sports? I think the answer to all th those questions are yes. <laughs> no, you can't. And yes, you can. Um, so I, I, I would say um, that Patience is the last great arbitrage in sports, let's put it differently. Uh, we do have an incredible amount of pressure, especially if you're in a job like mine. You have a, a very active board who is very competitive and they want to win. You have very passionate fan bases who will, will take to social media, like, you know, I guess medieval times they would charge the hill with, with horses and, and swords. You have your, your family, your friends, your community. Uh, you have the league, you know, you have to contend with the media, obviously, as it takes their fair share of attention. So, so yeah, there are a lot of constituents, uh, but it really depends on what you want to achieve and, and how willing you are to do what's necessary to get there. And uh, there, are, there are no shortcuts to the top, only to the middle. And um, or you can get lucky. You know, I just, I just, I never think luck's much of a strategy, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, I, I'd love to win the lottery. I think it'd be amazing, you know, love it. It'd be, be awesome. I just, instead, I just decided to work harder. And if, if luck comes our way with a certain draft pick that ends up being good or, you know, someone happens to fall into your lap, God bless America. But, but uh, you know, I, I just think it's, it's more a sense. It's more like, you know, we live in a 15 seconds of fame world. You know, it's like Insta famous, TikTok famous. Like we are staring right at that tree and we are missing the forest. And if you want to, um, I had a good friend of mine, Henry Johnson, runs Northern Trust, his trust company, he said to me the other day, he said, you know, I, I overestimate what I can do in a day and I underestimate what I can do in a year. And I think that's really interesting. I overestimate what I can do in a day and I underestimate what I can do in a year. And I think that's pretty true with all of us. And I, I wonder if we just look out on the horizon and say, whoa, I, here's, here's what I want to accomplish three years from now or five years from now or 10 years from now or one year from now. And then you write a st structure plan around that and then dedicate the time each day. And, and I, I think without that, we stand on the treadmill and hope to stay in place. And that's our best case scenario. And if we don't, like I, I'm not advocating for everybody to kind of conduct a, their own version of trust the process. You have to figure out what works in your market, with your situation. In our situation, when we walked in there, just so you remember, it's like we just done the Andrew Bynum trade which is arguably the worst trade in history where we, you know, gutted our picks and our young right. players. We had two first round draft picks in the next five years. And we were a cap team with, with not, not much to look forward to. And we were bottom barrel, bottom three in every business metric, season ticket base, season ticket revenue, attendance, sponsorship revenue, ratings, social media engagement, social media growth, everything we measure 
we were bottom three in the league out of 30. Right. And so, you know, as my, as my dad famously said to me, you know, son, even you can't fall for this floor. And I think he was right. You know, but, but to get out, you know, you look at, there are some teams, I don't want to name teams because I, I, you know, I work in this business, but there are some teams and, and you can look at them and, and they, they'll be bad for a decade or 15 years or 20 years. And that, you know, so at that point, like, aren't they already doing it? You know, they're just not doing it well enough. You know, um, what is the plan? So I, I, I'll say when I got to the Sixers, we haven't won 50 games since 2001. Right. And, um, you know, I, I think we are aspiring to doing something great. You look forward. I mean, we had a disappointment in the playoffs, obviously, but number one seed in the East. So, yes, we have come a really long way in eight years. But guess what? We didn't snap our fingers and get here. Right. And we've been in the playoffs for the last four years. And, you know, I, we haven't gotten out of the second round yet. But, you know, we were scratching the bottom before. Now, you look at this team, our best player is 26 years old. We have two global superstars on this team. We lock people up. We've got a world-class coach, Doc Rivers, Daryl Morey, Nelton Brand running the basketball. I mean, this is, it's a machine now. And, and can we win? Will we win it? I don't, I mean, there are 29 other teams that want to win. So in, in, in our jobs, we're trying to do this, trying to set up an organization so that you're in the conversation. And so that if the, if the chips fall your way, you, you get a chance to win it. I thought two years ago, we could have won it. I thought this year, I thought the chips were in our favor. We could have won it. And, um, but, but, you know, that's, that's the basketball God speaking. And you know, that's not me. And that's such an interesting point, again, the, the kind of difference between the sports business and any other business. If Coke and Pepsi, they can both win. Right? <laughs> I mean, they're going to battle each other over market share, and one's always going to have more than the other, and they're going to fight for it. But you know, they could both be successful, and their customers you know, don't care about that. You know, sports, as you said, it's one out of 30, and the other 29 you know, don't get there, and, and there's some level of disappointment among the fans. And, and sometimes that, uh, as you say, gets uh, can get into some. But you don't have media. to win. You don't have to win every year. I mean, you right. we, we sell two things. Sell win. Winning or hope, we got to sell one of those two. Yeah. And and hope for a better future is a wonderful thing to be selling. I'll tell you yeah. that. Oh, that's a great point. And just before we kind of leave that, the, the subject of, of of fans, you know, we've been seeing so many examples lately of of really the you know the the kind of power that fans have and and should have. You know, it's uh, they're the ones that are buying the tickets and buying the jerseys and supporting the sponsors and and all of that. And I think we've seen some examples of what can happen when some sports organizations kind of lose the sense of, of, of putting the fans first, you know, and I'm thinking particularly uh, most uh, of all of the Super League and what happened in European soccer uh, just not too long ago. I, I love from your perspective, were you surprised by, by, by what happened there with, with the breakaway and, and, and then that kind of all falling apart within about 24 hours? There's a lot of clamoring on social media. Um, I, I, I wonder if that's the vocal minority or not, you know, and I, th I think, you know, we have to get back to our roots of, of real research and real polling and real, real focus groups. We really understand what fans are saying. Um, so, so what was I surprised? I don't know. Was I, was I intrigued by the idea? Very much so. Do I think a lot of value could be created? Absolutely. Does some of that value mean putting on some extraordinary events for these same fans that would love to watch Liverpool play Barca? Yes, it does. Um, you know, did they, did they miss on positioning? For sure. Did they miss on marketing? Yes. Did they miss like on a basic PR strategy? Of course. Could they have an engaged social media strategy? Yes. I mean, this is like, you know, this is like the basics of how you launch and, and roll out a program. So, um, and, and, I, and maybe they had those things maybe they just went south or sideways or who, who knows or got leaked too soon or, um, but, but, but I, I like creating value I like big ideas I like you know innovation and challenging the status quo um, I used to have these two photos I should have kept them up in my home office but I had them up in my office for years it was a, a, a boxing black and white box, boxing photo and a black and white horse racing photo. And I, and I just put those up just to remind myself, you know, in the fifties and sixties, those were the dominant sports in America. Yeah. You know? And so I, I, I don't know. It's like, I, I, I look at our league, I look at the NHL and, and the changes they made to the game coming out of the last lockout. And I, and I look at the NBA and 
you know, we have a, a G League and now we have a league in Africa and a league in China and you're thinking, you know, we, we could stay the status quo. You know, I, I just, I rarely think that's the right way to go. Now, could you have, could they have formulated the program in and around some of the current happenings? Of course, like there's always tweaks you can make to the program. Uh, but I, I like big ideas. I like big thinkers. Totally agree with you there. It's, uh, you know, kind of in, innovate or die, right? But um, it just, it wasn't the idea, I think, that was that was bad, but the execution there, certainly, it, that was what was surprising to me, was that, uh, you know, it just seems like some of the research and some of the, the, the basic PR around it was was kind of missing, which was surprising from such, you know, such big uh, established organization. Yeah, I think also, you have to remember, you know, I worked at a league office, it's different, you know, um, I, I, mean, I, I don't know the, the, all the facts, but, you know, doing what we do at, at teams and clubs is very different from what you, you do at, at leagues and associations. Um, yeah. And I think that was, I believe that was team driven. And, um, yes. you know, sometimes you run, you run right into a wall if that's the case. Let me go back to the book because, you know, you, you wrote it at an interesting time, right? The, Hard, hard to say. <laughs> the last 15 months were, were interesting. Uh, there are a lot of words we could, we could put on it, but certainly a time of great upheaval with the pandemic, uh, polarizing politics, the reckoning with, with racism and social justice. And as you point out, you know, sports has such a great power to bring people together. It, it, your organization, HBSE, has done, and the teams uh, been real forces for good in your communities. But in today's world, we also see the, that flip side of any time a team or an athlete uses their voice. We know there are going to be people who don't who don't like it, and are, they're going to go on on Twitter and other places and and tell everybody how much they don't like it. I thought you wrote very eloquently about how you know your organization has taken a stand uh, and why. Um, and I'm wondering what the response has been from sponsors. Well, overwhelmingly positive. I, th I think, and I, I don't know if it's of our framing, you know, we have a wonderful marketing team and they, they package really well, or it's um, the, the fear that's running through corporate America of ending up on some, you know, whitest place to work list or, you know, um, or it's a, or it's just, the, the basic facts that that values like equality and um, are kind of inalienable rights. So uh, like we're, we're not, I mean, we, we wholeheartedly believe that you have this special opportunity and platform to, for social change and, and we're going to stand on the right side of history every single time. But your question around sponsors is interesting. It's like, well, the way we thought about it, which seemed to resonate, was for some of our marketing partners that didn't have activation in the black and brown communities or hadn't yet done a great job in, in DNI, and um, or were looking for, for platforms to grow and expand. We're safe and easy. That's what we are. We're just safe and easy. That's what we provide. And so we're... We're creative. Um, we have the trust of our community. Um, meeting Philadelphia and Newark and the surrounding areas, we um, we've done a, a more than a fair share amount, um, just in terms of like having you know thirty four percent of our organization um, are people of color. So it's a very diverse organization, and so so we speak from the heart and with the truth. We we hope to stand on the right side of, of history. And we create platforms to create opportunities for our partners to go and drive change and work side by side with us to, to make things better. Uh, so, so that part was pretty simple and easy. I, and I, 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 was, I was surprised. I, I will tell you, I, I had some really candid conversations with, with friends of mine who are you know, running companies all over the world. And um, you know, we have a reputation for, for being a very um, diverse and inclusive organization, which I'm very proud of. And you know, I was like, Scott, should I hire a chief diversity officer? I'm like, hey, you're the chief diversity officer. Mm. Like, no, you know what I mean? I go, I just want to make sure you know what I mean. It's like, there's one way to drive diversity in an organization. And that's for the CEO to stand up and say, hey, I need the final candidates. I need half the final candidates to be diverse. Right. 
or don't hire another white man for this position. Like we, we have to be stronger and better to drive diversity. And I, by the way, I have a wonderful chief diversity and impact officer, David Gould, who knows more about D and I than his pinky that I know in my whole body. So I'm not, I'm not disparaging the position. I love the position and, and, and I rely on it quite a bit. But 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 we, especially like white men who are running companies in America, you know, we have this special, special opportunity. And those of us in sports, what a gift. You know, we have we have everything at our fingertips and, and we can actually drive change, like real meaningful change in communities. And uh, so, so we didn't get any blowback from, from partners. We had more like reaching out to us and saying, can you help? We actually had one partner where we, we were not part of this program, but we went in and helped them design a program that they rolled out, which is pretty, pretty flattering too. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. My, my last uh, guest on, on the podcast was uh, Josh Epstein from BMO, Bank of Montreal. Yeah. And he was saying that, look, you know, we're a bank. We can do all of these great things out in the community and nobody's going to really care about it. We can put out our press releases and, and talk about it. He's like, but if I partner with, you know, the Bulls in Chicago or uh, Toronto FC in, in, in Toronto, then these kinds of programs, whether it's uh, uplifting uh, yeah, yeah. black owned businesses so or something, then people care. And, and uh, that's, that's why we do what we do. No, that, yeah. that's it in a nutshell right there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, we amplify any of the great works that some of these partners are doing. I want to switch gears a, a little bit because you know, I, I love having the opportunity to, to speak to, to folks who are at the top of the, uh, the food chain, if you will, you know, in, in an organization, because you get to see you know, all of, the, all of the, the, the moving parts. And one thing that, that I've been thinking about lately is you know, looking at the, the revenue pie for, for sports teams and leagues too, but we'll talk about teams. You got basically media rights, tickets, licensed products, merchandise, sponsorship. You know, those are kind of the big buckets and typically media accounts for the, the lion's share of that. But I'm wondering, as we, as we start to look down the road and we see the changes in viewing habits and the move to streaming and, and OTT and direct-to-consumer, do you see the size of those pieces, uh, kind of the share of the total changing significantly in the next, say, five to ten years? Uh, you know, would media get smaller and others get bigger, or do you think it's we're, we're getting yeah, smaller? no, it's pretty it's much a great, great thought, great question, Jim. Um, I, I mean, the, the the pie has been like, you know, like an amoeba moving for quite some time, and and I I think the most interesting change will clearly be what happens with the regional sports networks over time. Uh, some have been aggressive enough to call them melting ice cubes. I'm not that might be a little aggressive, but but that's the, the term I keep hearing. Um, and, and then that, that is forcing us that run organizations to become better marketers. I mean, this is not an, or, that is not an industry where we have been elite marketers by today's standards. We're good brand marketers, actually extraordinary brand, brand marketers, but we haven't been uh, growth, growth marketers. And so you, I've begun to see a shift where we put more resources towards content and data and, and we begin to build our own D2C models and machines. And so that's what you'll see. And that'll shift all kinds of um, revenue streams. The, the other part that's kind of interesting to think about is your, your traditional sponsorship bucket and your, your content um, sponsorship bucket. Th those are somewhat collapsing and then being pulled apart because we, we are selling differently. We're kind of maxing out what of the traditional uh, sponsorship elements are. Exactly. And then it's about how can we create platforms to drive drive change? And a lot of those are driven by media and social media platforms. So I, I think those are the, the two big changes. Kind of related to that, and, and I'll, I'll relate this back to the, to the book too, because you really discuss, I've heard you, on, you know, in interviews and in the book itself, you discuss your admiration for and kind of your affinity with, with millennials and, and Gen Z. So I think I am one at heart. <laughs> at heart, if not technically, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely not technically. <laughs> so two things. I'm curious to know uh, what kind of response um, you've gotten from, from young adults, the younger generations, to those your, your seven principles uh, and, and be where your feet are. So that's question one. Then question two, when we talk about that group, and again, in a sports context, you know, I keep seeing headlines and hearing people say sports has a Gen Z problem. You know, in terms of attracting them and keeping them as fans. So I'd love to get your perspective on, on that. Well, first off, you know, I've been talking about these principles 
at least in my current place for the eight years I've been here. So, um, so they've heard, heard be where your feet are. They've heard assume positive intent. They've heard what's most important. They've heard trust the process. They've heard fail forward. So, so it's a language that seems to resonate. We, we, um, I, I speak Gen Z. I do. I, I really love this group. You have to be transparent. You have to be accessible. Absolutely. Um, you have, you, you have to provide an opportunity. Uh, you, you have to stand for something. You have to be authentic. It's all this stuff. And, and by the way, the, this group, like if you're not any of those things, they just walk out the door. They don't need another job. Like when I was young, the thought of leaving a job when I was young without having a job would terrify me. Yeah. These guys are like, see, 86. <laughs> so, so, so that, that puts a lot of stress and pressure on, on organizations, but also provides some accountability and opportunity. And so, so we've been, we've done very well with that group. We, we're very much into developing the whole self. So mind, body, soul on the personal side and professional side, we do professional development as well. So we, we put an inordinate amount of resources into developing people, which just seems to resonate with this group. I, uh, I love this group. Okay. And I think that we are the ones that have the problem, not the Gen <laughs> So, so we, we have a like- very traditional view. Um, and in many ways we're stuck in cement or, you know, walking uphill, dragging a piano. And we have to, in this business, get out of our own way. And we have to understand what the, what the trends are, how people consume media, why they're interested and why they're not interested. And then reallocate our resources so that we can continue to grow the next generations of these business. Or we're going to be like my black and white photos. And we're going to be boxing and horse racing. And I don't want to be boxing or horse racing. By the way, I love boxing and horse racing. That's a whole other story for another day. Um, maybe that dates me more than, better than anything else. But I, I do, I do truly um, believe that that live content will hold the keys to whatever kingdom we want to open. Uh, but if we think we can show it the same, or do it the same, or be the same, or act the same, or sell the same, or present the same, you know, we got another thing coming. Um, so, so I, I think, you know, it's like, you know, I looked in the mirror, and the problem is me. You know, I, I think we, the industry, have this opportunity to reimagine and recreate and rediscover what it means to, to capture that new generation. That's different, you know, and you've seen that NBA and NHL, you've seen them get into like esports a little bit. You've seen them get heavy on TikTok and some of these other new, newer platforms. And so, so we're, we're towing the water, um, but it'd be interesting when, when that group, when that, those Gen Z's begin to, begin to get older and they continue to, and they control the, the spending power in households, that's when it's going to get real. And uh, we've got a lot of work to do to be ready for that time. Yeah, and that's I, I think that's what makes it an exciting time to be in the business. Uh, also, a challenging time. There's, there's, as you say, there's a lot of things to figure out, and uh, and hopefully we get it right. I appreciate it. I, I I think all of us need to to be aware and alert. I think there's a, a mental health epidemic in this country, and I would just encourage you to first just take care of yourself. Do something for your mind, something for your body, something for your soul every day. Get some sleep. Practice gratitude. Be where your feet are. Get your phone down and get your head up. Like do those six things um, every day and be aware. If someone doesn't have their video on Zoom or someone's mailbox is full or the neighbor hasn't come out of the house in the three days or you just, someone pops into your head and like that's, that's a prompting to go help. Reach out, connect with each other, send a text of gratitude. Make sure you're checking in on each other and take care of each other. The world's better that way. Like I said, that great advice, um, and, and so appreciate you taking the time and, and, and sharing that with with us. And, and there's a lot, a lot more of that where, where that came from in, in the book. Scott, just want to say thank you again for for joining us and, and wishing you and, and everybody in the organization all the best. And hopefully, we actually get to see you one of these days live and in person somewhere. Uh, always a pleasure seeing you. Thanks for the time. We'll talk soon, Jim. And on behalf of Ticket Manager, thank all of you for watching and make sure you join us for the next episode in our all-access interview series.